welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. This May, Badger Talks Live is showcasing teaching talent from the UW Dance Department, the first school in the country offering a collegiate degree in dance. I'm Claire Wilcox, originally from St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm finishing my first year at UW-Madison as a dance major. As someone who has found excitement and joy in studying Chinese dance for almost 16 years and now studying contemporary dance in the dance department, I'm pleased to introduce Associate Professor of Dance and Asian American Studies, Peggy Choi. Professor Choi is a dancer, choreographer, producer, director, and founder of The Key Project Incorporated a nonprofit organization that supports creative thinking and intercultural performance for future generations. Her life has been dedicated to the study of a wide range of movement practices with special focus on Javanese dance and Korean dance and Asian martial arts. She is a certified teacher of Chinese, of the Chinese healing practice Da Yin or Wild Goose Qigong. Her UW courses include Asian American movement and Afro-Asian improv from hip hop to martial arts fusion. Professor Choi will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to post them at the chat at any point. Please welcome Professor Choi, who will speak about building a room of one's own, a dancer's toolkit. Thank you so much, Claire Wilcox, and it is a delight to have you introduce me. Uh, and Thank you to the team of Badger Talks Live and really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Fran, uh, for inviting me to be in this, on this, on this uh, wonderful day with you all. Annyeong hashinika. Hello in Korean. Hinikara gina. That's Ho-Chunk for greetings from Dejo, Wisconsin. Uh, where the Ho-Chunk Nation has been in partnership with the Earth for at least three ice ages. Building a room of one's own, a dancer's toolkit. Virginia Woolf, living in England in nine, uh, 18, 1929, at the start of the Great Depression, wrote that in order for a woman to be a writer or artist, she needs money and a room of her own. Now in the 21st century, this notion of one room for one person is still a wonderful idea, but also it begs the question of who has access and who does not have access to space. This has long been a deeply troubling issue in the light of the forced removals of native nations, peoples, and the takeover of indigenous lands. In these times, it is important to have resources and space to create and dream in, but it is imperative to share resources and space, to imagine building shared commons that support divergence from the dominant center, that privileges continuous growth for profit, an exclusive center that prioritizes the most resources and the best rooms for only a few, which is the master's house, as Audre Lord would say. As a Korean American woman and dancer and daughter of Mary Huang Che and Duke Che, I participate in imagining and building shared spaces. I work to create space where diverse communities can feel supported to grow their cultural roots in rich directions and this requires a deep respect for a diversity of building tools. For me, honoring different foundations of movement and respectfully borrowing these movement tools is my process of embodying and harnessing healing energy for the many and not just the few. So beyond just thinking about hammers and saws, I'd like to share some of my own story of how I've crafted my own tools. This story really begins with inspiration from my own family history. My ancestors really didn't teach me about what tools to create and to use or borrow, but they taught me what the tools were for. 
Let's see. My grandparents on both my mother and father's sides were activists to build an independent Korea free from the Japanese occupation that had begun in 1910 and went through 1945. So here's my my, uh, grand, my mother's family, uh, Huang Cha Sa San on the left, and my grandmother Chang Ta San, and the children, Paul, Elizabeth, and Mary on my grandfather's lap. And my grandfather Huang Sa San was a school teacher in Shiniju at the northern border of Korea and China, and was part of the underground. Uh, independence movement against Japan. So after many friends were tortured and killed, the Japanese police were still on hand, excuse me, hunting down my grandfather. So he decided in 1912 that they should leave Korea, he and Chang Ta San, and they were disguised as Chinese refugees and then took a train to Shanghai uh, and then a boat to San Francisco. So once in California, my grandfather thought, we're in a free country, I am a free man. But there he faced racism and it was really hard for him to find work. So they picked tomatoes, cleaned houses, and eventually he managed to set up a tailor shop. And at night, so by day he was a tailor or you know picking tomatoes, and at night he was a member of Hung Sadan, a uh, which means Young Korean Academy, led by An Chang Ho, who is in the center front row. My grandfather is on his left, second from the right, first row, uh, and An Chang Ho is one of the most uh, influential beloved moral and political leader of the independence movement. So they were preparing to actually return. This is sort of like the think tank of, of uh, the independence movement. They were preparing to go back to Korea when it was independent to take leadership. Now, Korean immigrants were also part of the settler colonial history of Hawaii. And the indigenous term for Hawaii is Kape Aina. And um, so my father's family, the Chez, left Gyeongju province in the southern part of Korea to work on the Kauai sugar plantation. It was, this is on Chang Ho. So my grandfather, Che Du Wook, uh, pictured here with my grandmother on my dad's side, Helen Nam Che. Uh, later left, left the uh, Kauai sugar plantation and moved to Honolulu to again set up a tailor shop, what, but he was making um, military, U.S. military uniforms in Honolulu. Uh, but at the same time, at night, he was busy with the Korean Nationalist Association, another organization that strongly supported Korean independence. So here are the children, um, Herbert, my uncle Herbert, my father Duke, Jane and the eldest Marion. And as you can see, their tailored uniforms and Korean style dresses were tailored by my grandfather. So in San Francisco, um, my mother um, was five years old when her own mother died, Chang, Chang Ta San, and she was sent with Elizabeth to Honolulu to live with their grand aunt, um, Heisu. And I just knew her as Tutu, which is the Hawaiian word for grandmother. So Tutu was a uh, YWCA social worker uh, and she supported the Korean immigrant population, mostly helping the Korean picture brides uh, to adjust to life in Hawaii. And um, my mother remembers, so my, um, Heisu is on the right, Tutu is on the far right. 
So my mother remembers she was terrified when she had to go in the car in the night with Elizabeth and sit in the car while Tutu went into a house to break up a marital dispute. And from the car, they could hear screaming and they could see all kinds of objects flying through the windows, uh, through the view from the window, and even a knife passed by. So growing up in Honolulu, um, my family, uh, but, but let me go back to this picture. So really, you know, I grew up on occupied Hawaiian land, Kape Aina. It was illegally taken over by the U.S. government in 1893. So Queen Liliokalani, who uh, was ruling then, was forcefully removed. And um, since then, the islands have been illegally occupied. So this is kind of the colonial, uh, you know, lifestyle that I was brought up in. And here's another shot of my uh, tutu uh, was, had started a, a performance club called the Hyungje Club in Honolulu. And my um, aunt Elizabeth is on the far right. So they would share and learn about Korean culture in Honolulu. Um, so growing up and living in Honolulu, my family grew also in their understanding of the meaning of partnership with the land or the aina, that's the Hawaiian word for land. This understanding translated into my family's support for a free and independent kape aina, free from continued illegal occupation by the U.S. and a nuclear free Pacific. So these are still urgent issues that are continuing to this day. Here, my mother, several decades ago, uh, was protesting for a nuclear-free Pacific. So growing up in Kape Aina, I learned how to really love the land, the Aina, and actually, to love the land is part of what it means to be human. The Latin root of the word human is the word humus, and that means earth or ground. So looking back on my family history, I was guided into seeing the value of using whatever tools we could to carve out spaces of freedom and independence while loving and caring for the Aina or the humus. These are basically creative, creative problem-solving actions with tools. And as a dancer, I was really left on my own to find my own tools for creating a supportive community space. So creating my own tools has really not been a lonely process, you know, of me alone inventing whatever I needed to craft this communal space, because I am part of a number of lineages. And they have, I have been so fortunate to know great master teachers who have taught me Korean dance, Javanese dance from Indonesia. I learned Zen dance, a contemporary meditative form of dance from my mentor, uh, Sanok Lee, who used to be in New York, but now in Korea. I have learned Chinese martial arts, including Taiji Chuan in Honolulu and here in Madison with Don Coleman, uh, as well as being a certified healing, uh, certified teacher of the healing practice of Diane Qigong or Wild Goose Qigong from Master Hui Liu uh, while she was still alive in the Bay Area. Uh, lastly, for the last 13 years or so, I've been also studying and continuing to practice hip hop dance, particularly breaking and house with Seku Haru, Z Motion in New York City, and with Lacour Yancey in, here in Madison. So in learning all of these styles, these many lineages of st st styles, you might think, well, that I would go crazy or at least be very confused. 
And my practice of all of these styles would actually be incomprehensible if it were not for a common uniting, united factor. So all of the practices that I have studied are considered lifelong practices um, that all of them teach healing balance. So whether it's Afro or Asian uh, were, uh, you know, practices, the Afro and Asian views, worldviews actually intersect. And there is this belief or understanding that um, the, these practices unite the internal human experience or the embodied internal experience with the external environment that we live in. There's this linkage between what's in me and around me. And we then become sensitive through these bodily body practices of movement. We become more sensitive to the environment and can, can potentially make better ecological choices. And as seen through, you know, these Afro-Asian um, perspectives or, or way of life, really, um, it's this, these worldviews are attached to a respect for the earth and sky and an understanding that we are just a tiny part of the great universe. And even though dance, these dance styles, uh, martial arts styles are extremely diverse, whether they're from Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, African American, as in the case of hip hop, which is Af which has African roots or capoeira, which is a um, Brazil, African Brazilian martial art that I've also studied. They all share the sense of healing energy with the practice. And um, there's a sense that of embodiment with nature and it's a lifelong practice within a community. You cannot do it by yourself. So that those are the gifts of all that I've studied and that is the common focus. So here is a yin yang symbol. You probably have seen this before. It sort of wraps up symbolically um, this idea of unity of the whole universe. And we, within ourselves, we have this microcosmic unity. Uh, so this symbol of yin yang is a symbolic representation of the ever transforming energy um, of the universe and yin is the black part of this symbol the swirl of black which is earth it, it is um sinking energy whereas the white or the yang represents sky or the rising energy and these forces are always in transition and even within the yin and the yang there is a seed of the other energy all the time so it's ever transforming and this is a symbolic, um, a symbolic way of knowing what's happening within the body as we do, you know, practice those practices um, that I mentioned. So, so that's that's all I want to share with you um, for my screen, <laughs> my um, PowerPoint. And so, what I'd like to do is um, share a few examples of the movement with you. So um, should I stop share or will you do that? Oh, okay. oh, no, not yet. Stop share and so that I'm more, I can see myself. Yeah, so I, I would like you all, whoever you are out there to, um, to experience this with me. I want to uh, show you a very simple example. So I'm still seeing the, the PowerPoint. Is it going to go away? Oh, okay. All right. So anyway, um, I'm going to just modify my screen a little bit. And I want to share with you a little example of Qigong, and I'd like you to do it with me. So my feet are rooted into the earth. It's about, they're about hip width and parallel sunk into the earth. So you think about your feet growing heavy and relaxed. Each toe, you just let them sink individually. And at the same time, this uh, the 
top of my crown feel as if it is lifting towards the sky to receive sky chi or yang chi. So my feet are absorbing yin chi or earth chi while my top of my crown is floating up and receiving the sky chi. Within this, we'll do one Badwan Jin movement or a form of Qigong, which is called Eight Brocades, a very ancient form, about 2,000 years old. And we'll circle. This idea of circling the hands is part of this practice. So we gather the Qi or internal life force energy from the earth. Inhale and lift it up, exhaling. And our hands, you can see, are facing the sky as if you're reaching to the sky. And now, again, my hands circle overhead, inhale. And then as my hands pass my chest, I start to exhale, returning my hands down towards the earth. So let's do it one more time. Inhale. Hands rise as I exhale, they go above my head. I look in the middle of my hands and then I gather the sky chi and bring it down to the earth one more time, circling the hands, inhale. Big breath, exhale through the nose, reaching towards the sky chi and circling again to gather this chi and exhaling down. So that is one example of one movement from this Qigong practice that I teach. And I want to give you another example. So depending on the class and maybe the time or the year, I may teach some of these forms, I may not teach others. So another practice that I have met, spent many years learning is Javanese dance. So instead of these arm circles involving the whole arms through the fingertips, in Java, it is more specific to the joints. So I want everyone to bend your wrists, that's the joint, and place your thumb together with your middle finger. All right, so already there's a different kind of circular shape from Java, central Java, the court, the court town of Yogyakarta. And we lift our wrists, we keep that little, uh, contact with thumb and middle finger and we circle the wrists. Okay, so just take one and circle out and make the rainbow shape back. Do the other hand, inhale, you can do it with the breath as well and exhale. So this circular movement, if you can see my wrists are really more confined. It's not like the Baduan Jin, which is more general and larger. So that is another kind of circle from another toolbox. And then we have the circle, circular shape from hip hop or breaking, which is a, a very earthbound. And so this sense of earth and sky is represented in the hip hop breaking tradition. So we have, um, you know, the six step, which is you can do it up, you can do your six step on top or you can do it on the bottom of the floor. So you start doing this in six steps. And then you get up. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if you could see the circular movements I was making. My body was rotating. I was down, grounded into the earth. And this Afro, African-American tradition of hip hop, no matter how uh, popular and current it is worldwide, has embedded within it this healthy healing of the circular energy rotation. Okay, so um, I don't know if you could follow me, but hopefully you get a sense of some of the toolboxes I teach. Um, yes, yeah, so using these diverse toolboxes, I've just shown you three examples of three. Um, I'm creating new ways on a level playing field. So I teach and I create dances in the same way where I borrow these tools with a deep respect for the legacy and the history of these movements and with a deep humility so that I'm never stopping learning these forms. And in fact, 
my hip hop teachers who actually are in my dance ensemble as well, whenever they teach in my classes, they expect that I will be breaking with the students. And then they critique me in class. They say, okay, Peggy, that's okay, do this. <laughs> They're never stopping teaching me. And I respectfully have to take their corrections. So this is my way of finding and sharing new ways of communicating with our bodies across difference. So these languages on the same level playing field, mutual respect for all, all the teachers mutually respected, nobody is higher than the other, is a way of language invention to speak across differences. So um, let's see. Yeah, so I wanted to um, say that, you know, in my teaching, I teach the students and, and they'll have to create a dance, but there is usually a story that they need to either create themselves about Afro-Asian intersections or create a story based on an Asian American poem like Desert Run by Mitsui Yamada. So there is a story that we tell through the movements. It's not just learning tools for the sake of learning tools. So in my own dances, I create stories and express these stories as do my students. And I want to just show you and by showing a few videos um, of my work. So the first example is Wild Rice, a solo. And my friend Patty Lowe, I had asked her, you know, she had told me about the, uh, the, the um, controversy up on Bad River, up in Bad River. Uh, she is an Ojibwe. Patty Lowe is a member of the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. And she urged me, yes, go ahead and make a dance about this and call attention to what at the time was the big threat to the wild rice up in Bad River. And the Ojibwe are the guardians of wild rice. And um, the controversy involved the Gogebek Mining Company that wanted to make a iron ore mine just right by the river where the wild rice grew. And if they were successful, the mine runoff would pollute Bad River and the wild rice would die. So I did do this dance. Uh, I created this dance. I was honored because it was, uh, I was asked to dance this at the opening of the first Native Nations Summit here on the UW-Madison campus. Uh, and the 12 Native Nations representatives came to this summit. And so in this way, I felt I joined with the voices of protest against the Gogabit Mining Company. And so the mining company actually gave up and the, the mine was not built. So let's just see a very short clip of Wild Rice. When the spring snow splays the worry, leans me, shielding doubt about 10,000 things. I dread the snowmelt barren weakness. I long for the river to roll back the curtains, past the sunflowers, traffic and berries, moon by dawn, trouble by day. The next clip I'd like to share with you is another clip of a very different dance. Actually, it's called Samurai Mama's Revenge. And I created it during COVID on my cell phone. Uh, my son, Tony, helped me edit this. And it really is if any, for any other reason, I think I, I think back, looking back and reflecting upon this, I think it was made for the hip hop community. Uh, it's a homage to the music, the composer of the music, or the um, the his name is the Rizza. He is the head of the Wu Tang Clan, a hip hop giant. He is a hip hop giant, and he had created this music called Afro Samurai. But then I reinterpreted it in my dance. And I called it Samurai Mama's Revenge. Uh, it was dead. It is 
dedicated to women and the LGBTQ commu communities who have known what it means to fight their way out of being on the fringes or being trapped in the kitchen, being captive by their family to serve them. And it's a way of my, um, what is it? My uh, sense of solidarity in fighting out of these liminal spaces to a more central space. Okay, so well, let's see a clip of Samurai Mama's Revenge. That was a fantasy, you know, like of a housewife trapped in her kitchen and what she might do if she carried her frustrations out to the end. So the next uh, excerpt is called The Greatest Hip Dance Homage to Muhammad Ali. And this was a live performance in New York's Gleason's Gym where Muhammad Ali himself trained at some point, at one point. And you'll see my dancers, uh, who I've mentioned already, you'll see it'll open up with Lakur Yancey doing um, a piece about a dance about um, Muhammad Ali as an imagined constellation, that he is a constellation in the sky. I'm claiming the stars for Muhammad Ali. And um, then you'll see Z Motion, who is one of the boxers who, who, who represents Muhammad Ali, and then Sekou Haru in one of the, the excerpts that you'll see he is um, Malcolm X meeting with uh, Muhammad Ali. So please uh, play the clip. Stars wasn't about reading for parts on stage. Stars rumbled their bright existence across earth, struck jabs at lives pressing them down. But this one street, a furious comet. What kind of fight can fight against the fire of boys like me getting put out every day? I'm right. I won't be forgotten.
in my zoot suit, complete with the reet pleat, a killer diller long coat, shoulders padded like a lunatic cell, I am draped down. So my last uh, dance clip that I'd like to share with you is called Flight, Torn Like a Rose. It's very different from the previous dances. It was inspired by Attar's 12th century Sufi poem. He is Iranian uh, from, he is a Persian Sufi poet who lived in the 12th century. And he wrote this grand, beautiful poem called Conference of the Birds. And I, want, I created my own story inspired by that poem. I wanted to focus on the aviary habits of birds rather than other versions I've seen of Conference of the Birds where people uh, focus more on the, the relationships of the people in the poem. So um, here is a um, excerpt from this or different excerpts from this piece. You'll see my dancers that I mentioned also in this piece. Um, and really the, the, the um, main theme is the Sufi theme in, in that you're willing to self-sacrifice, you're even willing to sacrifice your whole life for a beloved or someone you love. So that is the very, very difficult Sufi um, uh, tenet. Okay, let's see the... Uh, Dance. I've shared my work with you and now I'd like to return to um, going back to that Badwan Jin movement I shared with you earlier of the circular arms and I'd like you to actually uh, do this again with me with awareness of your own breath. So I want you to experience this no matter how limited this is just to uh, share in breathing together. So this is a really important thing to do, to breathe together in community, strengthening the lungs in times of COVID. I mean, this is all uh, helpful actually. 
So I want you to go back to that movement with me and um, I'm gonna play some music. I want you, okay, so when we do this repeated movement, which you saw earlier, circling the ground to gather the, the energy from the earth and then you bring your hands up to the sky to receive the sky energy. So we'll repeat that. But then I want you to really follow your breath and just experiment. This is where I teach and I use also work in creative creating dances with my dancers. We do this improvisation. It's based on the jazz idea of the fake book where there's space to improvise if you know the foundation well. So I want you, even though we haven't had more than a few minutes together uh, with this form, we did everything together with right and left arms. But now I want, as you listen to the music, to just let your breath go and just let your body go and experiment with the different music. And, and right does not have to be what left is, but this idea of circle and breath together. Okay, so this is yet another step in how I teach, dealing with improvisation and in deepening your awareness of your own breath. Okay, so um, we can have the music and then we'll just do this together. No, no rules, it's free for you to experiment with your whole body, starting with the foundation of Adlan Jet. So yeah, share the music with me. Are you out of breath? Hope you are. So to quiet your own breath, all I tell my students to do is just raise your arms, breathing in, and lower your hands, breathing out. And you should have gained your breath back. That's all it takes. Okay, so thank you for joining me and getting to know a little bit about my family history and in creating tools as a dancer to carve out space, collective space, embodied space to heal together. And there's so many dance styles. There's so many ways of creating dance, but that for me is the central purpose of why I teach and why I create. So thank you. Peggy, thank you so much. What an interesting journey you've shared with us. And I'm so impressed that you are a master at your trade uh, and you're, yet you're still so open and willing to learn and grow, which I mean, I, I feel like we as humans get to a place where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm good at this. Like, I don't need to learn more and absorb, but clearly... <laughs> The whole precipice behind your work is continuing to learn and continuing to integrate. So hello, everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer. We're talking with dance faculty Peggy Choi today, also with Asian American Studies on campus. And she's just shared with us some really interesting information. And I love the, the background of your history also with your family and Hawaii and the culture and how it's so evident that that has really inspired your work as well um, and how you're always thinking about the earth and how, you, how your movement integrates with the earth. Just a beautiful story. So thank you so much for sharing. Feel free to post some questions in the chat for Peggy. And um, we have some comments here. Oh, Sophie Shafless says, so badass. 
in <laughs> one summation. <laughs> uh, we have an awesome comment and thank you for sharing. So people are really enjoying this out there. So um, I have a question about uh, hip hop as a genre that you've introduced and you did explain sort of the circular reference and your introduction of, right, and you're, you're being drawn to that genre. Clearly hip hop is going to draw a very much younger audience. And I'm just curious if part of it was an intentional integration because you wanted to work with younger audiences. Thank you for your what you just said, Fran, thank you for your question. Really appreciate it. You know, it really was not thinking about younger generation, what's current, you know, um, this is in 2009. When I started thinking about working with hip hop dancers, I was trying to find dancers for my Muhammad Ali project, which then premiered later, much later in 2013. So I was starting to think about dancers and who I wanted to have in my ensemble. Uh, and I, I auditioned many contemporary dancers, modern dancers, ballet, dan you know, I, I did these auditions in New York and I came away feeling so disappointed because they did not have the energy that I wanted and that I was searching for. And so then I started auditioning hip hop dancers uh, through uh, Seku Haru, who I worked with for many, many years. Uh, he, I knew him and he was in the hip hop community, community in New York. In fact, he is quite revered now as a senior, you know, master teacher. Um, so anyway, Seku gate got me in touch with hip hop, uh, crews, you know, they had their own crews and I had to actually go to audition these crew. I had to go meet these crews and one was, I could only go after 10 p.m. because that's when this crew was at this uh, community center and it was way up in, in Queens. So I had to take a subway all of there. I, I, I would, I'm amazed I did not get lost and did not chicken out, but I had to meet these people. And um, so I did audition them, but I did say it was really the power I was looking for, but I just wanted to finish the story of my audition. So I got them to come. But I said, you know, if you're 10 seconds late to this audition, I cannot audition you. So anyway, they came and they were 10 minutes late or whatever, half an hour late. And they begged me, they stayed. And I said, no, I can't audition you. So, you know, I had to take a very tough love stance to start working with B-Boys. But really it's like my admiration for them because this is from the streets and that you just, work and work and work on your own style. You develop your own style. You rely on your teachers, your mentors, but you're in the process of creatively constructing your own tools. And so that gives a certain energy to the dance. And that's what I wanted. And so that's what you saw in um, The Greatest. Um, and and it's, it's really an example of, of this tool making and it's from within, it's very felt. I had to actually train them to look out and up because they're very internal because they're doing it in the streets, they're doing it with each other. So it's kind of downward and internally uh, focused. So it was, it's been just eye-opening and very creative to um, work with um, the B-boys who I'm still in touch with and working with and learning from, yeah, thank you. And I, I see your mother's blood coursing through your veins as you are creating dance that also has an advocacy feel to it, obviously with the women's right piece that you did and wild rice all for a cause. So that's, uh, that's also a very cool thing um, that you shared with us. So you mentioned this background uh, of tailoring in your family. And I'm just curious, A, is that still happening in your family? Do you still have tailors in the family? And could that possibly be inspiring any of the costumes? Because obviously with the aviary piece, the, the costumes are so striking. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. Um, those are not made by myself. They were made by Andy um, Tom Thompson. So, but, but I'm very aware of costuming actually. And so, you know, in Hawaii, 
in Cape Aina growing up as a girl, you're sent to sewing school. So they were these years, you know, where everyone, we didn't get a lot of clothes coming in from the continent, shipping and all. So we had to make our own clothes. And um, so I went off to sewing school with my cousin. My sisters went to sewing school and um, my children have followed when when they were in Hawaii, they continued. So I got up to be quite good uh, drafting patterns because these immigrant women, these Japan, you know, I took from this Mary Miho, very, very famous <laughs> Japanese seamstress. She, she created patterns and so I learned to draft. And so I'm very aware of how to construct a costume, how to um, really appreciate good tailoring. But I don't think that came because I didn't know at the time that my grandparents were I mean, I knew my grandfather in Hawaii was a tailor because I would visit the shop on Saturdays, but um, I don't know. So I think that, yes, it's just because the expectation in Hawaii is that you go to sewing school and we all learned. And um, yeah, I think it's, I'm very actually happy that I did because I can understand construction of garments, um, but I, I don't really make my own costumes anymore. And the last costumes I did, it was just cut with the scissors and put it on with holes. You know, I made holes and <laughs> less interested in construction. Excellent. Well, Peggy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and for sharing these awesome tools that you have, you know, created and perfected throughout the years. Just really appreciate you sharing those with us. So thanks so much for spending time with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Right. Well, please join us next Tuesday, May 17. We're going to continue to celebrate the UW Dance Department as we talk with Li Chao Ping. Um, and she's going to be talking about her overarching philosophy on teaching choreography, dancing and living as she dances her way through life. An another outstanding dance faculty we'll be talking with. Please be sure to visit us at badgertalks.wist.edu. You can uh, check out the Badger Talks podcast. Actually, today we just released the most recent episode where Ben is talking with Chao Ping. So please check that out. See the upcoming schedule of live talks uh, on that webpage. Sign up for our email list. Consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by grant funds. And then search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff who've signed up to give talks in your community around the state. Thanks for tuning in. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.